Jenny McCarthy Show. Oh! Welcome back to the Jenny McCarthy Show. Jenny McCarthy Wahlberg. All right, so excited to talk to my next guest. I'm sure you guys um, at least have experienced or know someone that have been in difficult relationships, sometimes uh, abusive, sometimes... Um, I guess they're all considered abusive if they're bad. Uh, I don't know. We're going to talk to her and find out. Brittany, Br- is it Brittany Louise Taylor? Brittany? Yeah, it's Brittany. You got it. I mean, sucky love stories. Um, you know, you can be dating a dick, but they aren't necessarily abusive. Correct? Yeah, there's different levels of bad. <laughs> so I think they're just like, you know, normal bad where it just, you know, you don't maybe get along or you fight. And then there's like levels of deception bad where people like try to do awful things to you. Where do you think that line is? I mean, I think it's like a moving target kind of a line. But where's that line when you start to hear a friend talk about their boyfriend who's, you know, doesn't come home on time, which is kind of a dick move when the dinner's made and him belittling her? Where do you find the line between dick and I think abuse? I, anytime you start to be afraid of someone, I think that's the line. Because, you know, there's going to be normal fights. People are human. You know, I think that anytime you start to be where the person that you're with, that you don't want to say the wrong thing, they start to control you where you change as a person. Yes. Like, that's a huge red flag. That is a huge red flag. And usually you don't even realize you're gone until it's too late. Um, the book yeah, is... Yeah, they're too good. Yeah, they start slow. They it... start slow. It's a ramp up. And before you know it, you're being controlled and turned into a yes person. A hundred percent yes. I lived this life. The book has come... Oh, the book is called Overcoming Unhappily Ever After. Um, so it's, it's a, a sucky love story. Yeah. Oh, sorry. I'm looking at, oh, that's, you're holding the Don't sign you on your book. A sucky love story. Oh my God. You're so pretty girlfriend. Thank you. Well, that's a little bit of Photoshop. You know, it always helps. <laughs> Tell me about it. Okay. So uh, you're a YouTube star. You got entangled with a man who allegedly has ties to the Serbian mob. Uh-huh. How does that yeah. happen? Oh gosh, Tinder. I um I was just another lonely person in LA who was working all the time and you know, I had a friend that was dating using Tinder to like find girls and a couple other friends. That was when it first came out about like 2015 or a little bit earlier, so it wasn't like you know, it was it was there weren't the options. There weren't Bumble, there weren't, you know, safer sites. Everyone was kind of on Tinder. Not that Bumble's any safer than anything else, but um I signed out, started swiping, you know, went on some really good dates, some really funny dates. And before you know it, I met Milos and he said he was a doctor from Europe. He had an English bulldog and an accent and he was just like, like charisma to the max. Like Mm. he could make anyone fall in love with him, guy or girl. So I I know those people, they they like can charm the pants off of anybody they have like we yeah i take him to a party and like my friend's dad you know he's a big hollywood writer and before i know it he has him like getting out the good wine and they're sitting down and like having a bromance like he was just that kind of person do you think tinder is a way for predators to get unsuspecting victims i think online dating in general because they kind of you know they look for you know nice people they look for people that are looking for love and I think that, you know, that there, it's just a, it's just another way for them to go shopping for people. So I, I think that you could be at a coffee shop and probably meet a predator, quote unquote. But, you know, online has definitely made it more accessible where right. they can just sit in their house and kind of swipe through and find people they think might meet, like meet their criteria. Now, when you say they, they, they search for someone that meets their criteria, do these psychopaths, sociopaths, narcissists know that they're they're basically... Uh, you know, being a predator to to do something specifically bad to a person or in their sick brain, do they think they're trying to find love, too? And that's how they go about it. By abuse. Well, I mean, I'm, I'm not an expert, but like since I've gotten out, I've like, you know, I've read a few books about, you know, people that are sociopath or have, you know, the that kind of disorder. And I, I mean, do they, you know, a lot, it depends, I think, if there's a spectrum, do they feel any kind of empathy? I think for them, it's all about getting what they want and survival and it's not about you at all. It's all about them. So they don't really, you're right. you know, the only emotion that they feel is anger. And the only thing they want is power and money. And, you know, so they don't care what they would do to you to get that. It's a feel good fix that they're looking for. I need someone. to. Yeah, I think, I think they get a high. Like, yeah. I think with my ex, it's, you know, he started off like, but even in my gut from the beginning, like, 
he on paper was perfect, like tall, gorgeous, and had a good job, doctor, and a pet. And But something in my gut knew that it wasn't right, and that's Ooh. where I got in trouble when I didn't listen to it. Because if you're around – now I can spot it in a heartbeat. Like I'm around people, I'm like, ooh, sociopath. Like you can just see it in their eyes. Totally. See it where they just don't have a soul but you know if you have never been around that you just know something is off so I think that's like the first red flag like why is there nothing that you can see that's tangible but you still feel like you should run (laughs) so So because it's so difficult to spot someone like this you really have to rely on your intuition you really yes and it's there for a reason and I think that you know you know you can tell right away whether if, if something in you goes, ooh, like, you know, your, your skin crawls a little bit. Or I remember on our, like, third date, you, like, tried to touch my leg, and I flinched. And I was like, ooh, don't touch me. And I'm thinking, here's this guy who, like, looks like Chris, like Chris Hemsworth's body double, like, in such good shape and, wow. you know, tan and gorgeous. I shouldn't be wanting him to have some contact, right? Right. But when he would touch me, like, until, like, day eight, I just flinched. I didn't want any contact, I think. But I kept talking myself into it, and yep. that was the problem. I kept on paper going, okay, he checks all these boxes. Maybe I'm nervous because I've dated mostly artist types, and this guy, you know, has a car and a job. You know? right. I thought maybe that was it, why. It's like it's when we let our, like, not to get all like, spiritual, but, like, when we let our mental um, – you know, drive us instead of our gut and our heart. Yeah. You have to go back to yeah, those. That, you get in instincts. trouble. You always get in trouble when you try to talk yourself into something. So you have, like, if it isn't where you know, like, in your heart that, like, this is right, like, that, you should listen. A Sucky Love Story is the name of the book. I'm yes. going to keep plugging it so people pick it up. So wh- <laughs> where in the relationship, because I would imagine there were some things that went right as you convinced yourself, but when did you know in your gut, okay, shit. Something's wrong. Well, I mean, it started like, you know, like, you know, his family was not, his family was wealthy from Europe. They started cutting him off financially. So our honeymoon phase didn't last very long. Like before you know it, like he had ended up moving in with me and I was like financially supporting him to get his boards done. And his family was like, you know, calling up and screaming and yelling at him every day. And that wasn't necessarily a red flag, but it was more when the behavior started to change. It's like, you know, he was so sweet and like this perfect gentleman. And then he would start going off on me. And I remember that I would count the days in between his blow up. So it didn't start off being physical abuse. It was mostly mental. And I, you know, I realized now that he was just training me. Like he would just, you know, training me to bend to like whatever he said in his will. But at that point, I didn't see that as a red flag. I just thought I just kept blaming myself. Yeah, thought, you, okay, you well, said you said you know. I'm taking care of him, so he feels insecure as a man, so it's coming out sideways. Yeah. And, and and also too because like he was leaving everything, like his you know his family you know was against him to date me. I had that guilt, like I felt like it was my fault ah. that there was this rift in his family because he was staying in the United States with me and not going back and helping them with the family businesses and whatever. Right, so, right. The stories um, we tell ourselves. But, yeah, but the big, like, first red flag was in, because um, I met him in 2015, and it was January 2nd, 2016, I he got a phone call, and then he was just, like, turned white as a ghost, and then, you know, basically said, there's something he needs to talk to me about, and he told me that there, I'm going to be contacted by this woman named Bunny, don't believe anything that she says, that she's just a call girl, and... <laughs> She found out that I am already married, and what he said, he gave his last $170,000 to um, marry this older Russian woman to get a green card so he could stay in the United States and date me. Oh, my God. (laughs) Yeah. So the the woman used to call all the time, and he told me it was just his drunk Russian friend, and he's like, oh, no, she's like a grandma or whatever, and then, then, I mean, I think that was the first. I, even though I believe Milos at, at that point, I thought it was like a really messed up like love gesture, like and illegal. But right. you know, I he kept saying he's like you have to believe me. I'm like I will prove it to you that you know that she's just a call girl, and she kind of came on really strong too. Like she kept messaging me on everything and sending photos, and he he showed me online how you can take these apps and you can generate text messages. Like you can put in like you know date, time, battery power, right. photos, and. He said, look, she made up all these conversations. Like, this isn't real. Like, she's a call girl. You know, and she was this really, like, sexy, gorgeous girl. So, I I mean, it wasn't – his lies were always believable, if that made sense. But 
uh, at that point, I had a job that I got. I was hosting for a big car company, and I had to go to Detroit. And I, I remember being on the plane. I, I felt like I had been cheated on, even though I thought I hadn't been cheated on at that point. And I think that was the, the starting point of when I was like, what? is going on like and then he told me that his you know don't worry about it because like you know my family's going to take care of it because like you know my my mom's business partner is high up in the serbian mafia (laughs) so god uh, yeah i mean luckily i had like a week away so i was in detroit and you know people are probably thinking girl run you're crazy but at that point i was had over heels in love and I, i kept making justifications i kept thinking well you know, I, he couldn't help what he was born into any more than I could help anything. So he couldn't help that it, his family was involved with the mafia, like, any more than I could help that my dad was an airline pilot, you know, so. I'd be interested to know I, on that week away, um, because I, I highly suggest anybody yeah. that might, they think they're in a kind of an abusive relationship, by taking a week away and you disconnect out of that energy, it helps you wake up a little bit. Did you ever have but even? But then I, I still... I didn't completely, but then, I mean, I did, it was the start of my awakening, if you want to Got call it. Got it, okay. But then, but then from there, like, I, I kept obsessing about it. Like, you know, I, even though she would tag me and post with them, but it was nothing like, it was them in a group together, because he would go out to dinner with her and her friends. Like, you know, so I, I was never a clingy girlfriend. I see some of his guy friends were friends with her. So, like, you know, they're all, like, in that Russian like Serbian group in LA. So I, it was believable that she was this probably prostitute hanging out with him and his guy friends. And there weren't, well, there weren't any photos of them, like, you know, facing each other. Right. Looking so it basically it was eyes. believable. It was believable to you. Exactly. Yeah. So, so then come March that year, I was still hosting for that car company. And I, at that point, I think I wanted to break up because he was basically, you know, I, I started to think, okay, wait, I'm paying all the bills. He, you know, still doesn't have his boards done to be able to practice medicine. Like, I'm, you know, he, he's got mafia ties. I don't know if he cheated on me. It just started to become where the love was lessening. Like, I wasn't, like, I felt like I loved him, but I wasn't in love. And then I went to New York in March of that year. And then while I was there, I was vegan for a while, but I kept craving protein. I was like, oh, my gosh, I just want a protein bar or something. And my period was late. So my plan was when I got back from New York, I'm like, I'm going to end this. I'm going to like, you know, he needs to at least move out. I need to figure things out. But then I ordered from Amazon, like this big pack of 25, like pregnancy tests. Cause they have those with like the P strips. Oh, and no, I just did it. when I got, when I, when I got back from New York to the house and I like, you know, tried the first one, it was like pregnant. Instantly. Oh. And I did five in a row. Pregnant, oh, pregnant, and- oh. That, and I like you know what's even stupider is that we weren't using any protection because he was a quote unquote doctor and he kept telling me it's like oh no if I pull out you can't get pregnant and oh. I kept believing him even though I'm an educated female oh my that god he's a doctor and he's like oh he's like even you know healthy people in a relationship like you know have a really hard time conceiving like trust me there's no possible way and you know basically he got me pregnant so of course do you know how many guys these sociopaths try to get me pregnant I mean like yeah. purposely <laughs> try to get me pregnant. I'm like, oh my god! I can't believe you just fucking did that. Like, it's crazy, but it's up to us. Yeah. You? Oh my! See, we're already friends. Okay, we have so much in common. But um, no. So at that point, like, I, you know, I, I, I mean, I'm kind of ashamed. Like, I, I thought about not keeping my son, and it wasn't. It was just like I wasn't in love with him. He was so abusive mentally, and I just wanted to get rid of him. Like, and then now I find out I'm pregnant, and that would tie me to him forever. But then I couldn't go through with it. I had an appointment, and I just I couldn't do it. So, so you, so you had you, we, you 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 had your baby. I had my baby, but then while well, we were this is even gets crazier. So while I was pregnant, then Milo should told me when I first met him that he had invested some money in a fund in Russia. And during sanctions, like, you know, the, you know, the U.S. had done, like, he couldn't get the money out. And then, surprise, surprise, like, when I'm, like, four or five months pregnant, he is going to get $10 billion. So, and that's with a B, $10 billion. So, <laughs> he enlists a real estate agent in um, a friend of ours to start showing us, like, multi-million dollar properties in Malibu and and everywhere. Like, and then he's like, no, we need to go to San Diego. I can get, you know, my board's done there. Like, there's four teaching hospitals to be better for our sons. We start looking at like Rancho Santa Fe. So we, um, he convinces me to put my house up for sale. Cause he's like, look, you, you know, you're, you have it, but look, we're going to have all this money soon. Why keep your cute little house? And, in like in, and I too had really bad morning sickness. So I had gone into 
like a serious amount of debt because I was the only one paying the bills and throwing up all day and I wasn't working up until my third trimester. So um, I agreed. I put my house up for sale. So when we have it on the market and already people like putting in offers, because it like, you know, things in my neighborhood sold, you know, sell pretty quickly because Highland Park's up and coming or whatnot. Yeah. Or I think it still is. But um, so when I do that, then he tells me that the banker ran away with the money. So I, my house is up for sale. I'm in debt. I'm extremely pregnant. I'm like packing the house up by myself while he's the studying. The banker ran away with the money? With yeah. He's like, don't worry, we'll figure it out. Like my, the business partners will get, you know, whatever. And um, he's like, you know, I'll still get my boards done. And then our, our plan was to still go forward. Cause like, you know, at that point I, my house is already pretty much sold and I didn't want to let the real estate agent down and I needed the money. So my, we sold my house. We moved down to San Diego to a townhouse that I really couldn't afford, but he insisted that I get a three bedroom because his mm. mom was coming mm. into town for the birth mm -hmm. and he's like you know she's gonna be staying for six months there's no way i'm gonna go to a friend's house or whatever so i get some place that's more than my mortgage in la down in san diego they're, te he, they're telling I'm me i have to... three minutes left so i know I, I, i'm okay. sure your story's okay, long really, enough i want quick. you to get no, yeah, no, no, in there okay okay so, so basically you know mom goes in town she's crazy i have the kid uh, they end up moving out and then milo fakes cancer to get back into the house oh and God. then when I figure out that he's faking cancer is when I make a plan and leave him and the whole I mean the, my story is even crazier than just the things there but I you think never that, married him that, right no never married him I don't know if he's a doctor I don't know I don't know if anything of our relationship is real is moral of the story and they, it was just artistic the way that he crafted everything so and and, and, and think, you don't collect child support from him no God no I don't want any I mean, and the I um you know I was rewarded a two year restraining order for domestic violence because things did get pretty heavy towards the end. And, mm. Um, I think that's the biggest thing is like even now there's still scare tactics that happen, and anyone that's in a relationship like this, you you have to stand your ground and rely on your friends because they're bullies. But you know you you have to fi figure out a way to protect yourself, and if you have children, protect your children, and it's scary. So well I think said. that. Yeah, it's the biggest mission that I've done is I've just I've had this crazy need to tell everyone what happened just so maybe people can learn from my story and it can save if I save one person then it was worth it. Exactly. You were able to get out with a child in debt and I think the biggest thing that yeah. I always try to tell people, ask for help. It's amazing oh, gosh, yeah. how many people, yeah. yeah, just tell everyone and anyone and you will get the help. Um, thank you so yeah. much for t sharing your story. Thank I hope people you. pick up your book like crazy. It's called A Sucky Love Story, Overcoming Unhappily Ever After. Uh, thank you so much. I really, really appreciate you thank coming you on. Thank you for having me on. And good luck to you. I hope you do find the love of your life because you deserve it. It's just not online. We'll see. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Somewhere, but you deserve it. Thanks yeah. so much, sweetie. Yeah. Bye. Quick break. We'll be right back. Jenny McCarthy Show. Oh.